Welcome back. In this lecture, we're going to explore cardiovascular disease and determine what are the risks. But I'm going to start out by telling you a story. My first year at the Houston Texans, I had the privilege of looking at everybody's lab work. And I had a young man, 27 years old, who played a, a big program in Texas, come to me and his lab values were a mess. His cholesterol was high, exceptionally high. And as I was sending him to the cardiologist in Houston, he got cut by the Texans and picked up by another team. After he left Houston, he went to his other team and suffered a heart attack at 27 years old. So the tragedy of that is that people looked at him and said he was physically active, he worked out. Yeah, he ate a lot, but you know, he's burning all this off. He doesn't have to worry about heart disease. And that actually is a fallacy that cost this young man, man his football career as well as, as his ability to earn a living because he had significant complications after his MI, myocardial infarction. So unfortunately, we've got this really scary um, disease that faces us, cardiovascular disease. And it's the number one cause of death and disability in the United States and most European countries. And it's hard to say in this day and age that that's tragic, but it is, because we've learned a lot about cardiovascular disease. But a lot of the stopping of cardiovascular disease really requires a reframe for most of us. Some sources say that approximately 50% or one out of two Americans will develop some form of heart disease within their, their lifetime. It kills more, cancer, kills more Americans than cancer and many other chronic illnesses. But if you ask most women what they fear most, they fear breast cancer and not necessarily cardiovascular disease. Just like in my football player, he just didn't develop cardiovascular disease at 27. This is a disease that actually begins in childhood with cardiovascular injuries, inflammation, which we'll explore, and plaque buildup accumulation. So what, the mean, what that means is that the prevention efforts must, must, must start in childhood. So if you have children or grandchildren, you can't say, oh, you know, I ate that way when I was a child. There's no reason why they shouldn't have whole milk as a 10-year-old. You know, everybody loves pizza, so we're gonna get pizza two to three times per week because after all, they're children. Keep in mind that those habits they develop as children are going to be difficult for them to change. So one of the best gifts that you can give your children is cardiovascular protection. And again, continue that throughout the life cycle. In this lecture, we're going to look at different types of cardiovascular disease, some modifiable risk factors that you can actually change, some things that you can't, and have you be a little bit better consumer in terms of predicting your risk. We're going to start out with the skinny on cardiovascular disease. Some information on types, terminology, and again, common symptoms. This is not, however, to replace a physical exam by your physician. This is more an overview of the types of cardiovascular diseases that we can encounter. Angina, or sometimes pro pronounced angina, can be described as severe chest pain that's generally considered to be a lack of blood supply or oxygen to the heart muscle. Sometimes people describe it as discomfort, pressure, heaviness, a tight feeling rather than a sharp pain. And this angina can be either stable or unstable. Well, aside from the chest, pain can be experienced in the upper abdomen, back, jaw, neck, shoulders. So what you might confuse as heartburn could actually be angina. Stable angina is oftentimes experienced in times of emotional stress or physical exertion. So you go out, you get up first thing in the morning, you go exercise, and you feel this little tightness in your chest, and you might just say, oh, you know, it, I wasn't warmed up, or give another excuse, but pay attention to those symptoms. It can be made worse with cold weather. It can may be made worse by having a full stomach, but it's generally no more than three to five minutes in duration. Sometimes it's accompanied by nausea, sweating, shortness of breath, but hallmark is it gets better with rest. If it's unstable angina, it occurs even at rest, it lasts longer, and if your physician has prescribed medication, oftentimes the medication becomes ineffective in terms of reducing the symptoms, the pain and the discomfort. Well, what does this have to do with nutrition? Its most common cause is coronary artery disease. As plaque in the blood vessels builds up, blood flow is restricted and deprives the heart muscle of oxygen. Now, atherosclerosis, on the other hand, 
is that the walls of the arteries become damaged in some way, shape, or form. And some people believe it can be cigarette smoking, um, chronically poor diet, but in particular, the oxidation of LDL cholesterol, and remember, we're going to con continue to explore LDL cholesterol. The oxidation of LDL cholesterol may indeed be one of the damaging factors in terms of the damage to arterial walls. So what happens after this arterial wall is damaged? Well, our immune system comes to the rescue. It sends white blood cells, or sometimes known as leukocytes, to correct the problem and help to absorb the oxidized LDL. Most specifically, this is under the direction of monocytes and macrophages, two, two types of white blood cells, which actually trigger a cycle of events that involve inflammation and ultimately the development of plaque. And I will remind you of this when we come to cancer and other diseases. This level of inflammation, this inflammatory process, is a major disease risk for the development of heart disease. So as we go through how do we treat this, We'll talk over and over again about anti-inflammatory compounds in your diet. Things such as nuts, uh, dark berries, all have natural and anti-inflammatory properties. Certainly omega-3 fatty acids have natural anti-inflammatory processes. So once we've got this damage, the LDL cholesterol readily enters the arterial walls and stimulates the production of something known as cytokines. And cytokines, again, are another kind of inflammatory compound. So I want you to think about this process is there's damage to that arterial wall and the damaging sends in this rescue team of white blood cells and the whole process of inflammation begins. Once the arterial wall becomes inflamed, cholesterol plaque is deposited in the walls of the artery and causes the, the smooth muscles of the artery cells to enlarge and form what is known as a fibrous cap over the affected area. Inflammation is a key finding in many chronic illnesses. There are some diagnostic tests that your physician can do to see how much inflammation you have. And again, we'll talk about this in further lectures. Well, as this plaque builds up, it reduces blood flow and increases blood pressure. Think about that just like the pipes in your house. We've all had the experience when our sink is backed up. We've all had uh, kind of a rotor rooter person come out and clean out our pipes. Well, in reality, that's what's happening in our arterial walls. As the blood flow becomes constricted, the pressure to pump that blood through the, the arteries becomes increased, high blood pressure increase, increases, and it's kind of like the sludge that builds up in your pipes, increasing the pressure within the arterial walls. Again, oftentimes this is going to start in childhood, and in studies done with adolescents, it's found in most um, arterial walls even as early as adolescents. The problem is, Early on, the early stages of this game, other than looking at some blood cholesterol markers, there are no symptoms, and it's not generally detected by most diagnostic uh, tests. Of the 24 million individuals in the United States diagnosed with heart disease, unfortunately, oftentimes the first symptom is a heart attack or sudden cardiac death. And again, that's tragic when we've got all these warning signs coming along the way, letting us know that there's, there's trouble coming. So when you get your blood work done, you, get a high, you have a high cholesterol or your triglycerides are high, any of those other warning signs, I want you to think about that as a warning sign that you would have that something's wrong in your car. You wouldn't ignore, you wouldn't ignore the flashing red light saying your oil is you're out of oil or you're out of gas. You'd pay attention because you don't want to deal with the consequence. Here's another great uh, time to pay attention. Dietary interventions here are unbelievably effective, and uh, again, exercise and diet oftentimes go together like peanut butter and jelly, um, good apart, much better together. So diet and exercise play a key role in the management of or the prevention of cardiovascular disease. Well, what happens when you actually have a heart attack? Severe damage and death occurs in that ar arterial wall, causing death to the heart tissue. The blood supply to the heart is interrupted. And due to the blockage of an artery, the, oftentimes what happens is you have a rupture of that fibrous cap. It ruptures, and as it ruptures, these white blood cells come in. So now the plaque has actually exploded, and we've got this collection of white blood cells that move in like an army. And what they actually do is cause the platelets to aggre aggregate, stick together. These platelets are coming in to deal with the injury, and as they stick together, they actually form a clot within your arterial wall. 
Some estimates suggest that uh, a major cause of heart disease is not just the actual constriction of the pipe, the constriction of the arterial wall, but actually what's happening is that fibrous cap that's on that top of that plaque ruptures White blood cells and platelets come in, they form a clot, and that clot is what's restricting blood flow. So what about a cerebral vascular accident, oftentimes known as a stroke? It's the same kind of process. It's damage to the brain tissue and subsequent loss of brain function due to an interruption in the blood supply to the brain. So if you think about a myocardial infarction as a heart attack, a stroke is a brain attack. And again, most often due to the formation of that blood clot within a vessel, an embolism, where a piece of that plaque breaks off somewhere and causes a blockage. Now, this type of stroke is known as thrombitic. It forms a thrombus. It's a thrombitic stroke. Hemorrhagic stroke is different. Hemorrhagic stroke is simply defined as bleeding into the brain. Think of a hemorrhage. In this case, the hemorrhage is in the brain. Well, a great example are the Greenland Eskimos. The Greenland Eskimos, as a population, are obese and they smoke. You would think that's not good for heart health, that's not good for the prevention of cardiovascular disease. They eat a high-fat diet of marine protein. Now remember, they're, they're fishing for their own cold water fish, key point, cold water fish, and so they may be eating whale or seals or other marine protein that they're, they're harvesting from the seas. Now, Greenland Eskimos have an increased risk of hemorrhagic stroke. Why is that the case? That high marine protein diet is high in omega-3 fatty acids, and we've discussed in previous lectures the role of omega-3 fatty acids, that they can interfere with blood clotting. So the Greenland Eskimos don't die of heart disease. They don't have a heart attack. They don't die of thrombitic stroke. What they die of is hemorrhagic stroke. So that's why I'll remind you that a large dose of omega-3 fatty acids should be ordered by a physician. Currently, most recommendations for omega-3 fatty acids include somewhere in the range of two grams of fish oil per day. If your dose is larger than this, or if you're taking any other blood thinning agents, please discuss this with your physician. The key message here is that omega-3 fatty acids can be both helpful in the prevention of the most common forms of heart attack and stroke, and harmful because they can increase the likelihood of hemorrhagic stroke. So what are your symptoms of a stroke? Well, it includes things like dizziness, severe headaches, nausea and vomiting. And oftentimes, unfortunately, this doesn't necessarily get our attention. Why is that the case? Well, if you think about it, how many times in your life have you had a headache? Every time you have a headache, you're not necessarily thinking stroke. However, if it becomes numbness in the limbs, slurred speech, the inability to speak, vision loss, lack of coordination or the inability to walk, that really is your warning sign. So if you're working with a colleague or you're out somewhere with your spouse and all of a sudden someone cannot even communicate with you and it's almost this blank look on their face, they've lost the ability to speak, you really need to think about calling 911. Early intervention can be life-saving. Now certainly there are interventions that we can use to discuss how to treat that high blood pressure, and dietary interventions are gonna be included in the lecture on the DASH diet. Well, there are other forms of cardiovascular disease, probably most notably congestive heart failure. And this is structu structural or functional problems within the heart that impair its ability to provide adequate blood flow to the rest of the body. So think about your heart as a pump, and that pump becomes less effective. It's not pumping as hard, or it's pumping at irregular rates, and oftentimes um, this prior heart damage, something that's happened in the past, cardiovascular disease, impairs the, the functioning of the heart. When the heart can't pump, nutrient delivery is compromised and s fluid is retained because the pump can't pump the blood. It cannot deliver blood to the tissues. So what ends up happening is the fluid accumulation is pretty significant and oftentimes sodium restriction must be added to minimize the fluid retention and congestive heart failure. Well, what are the nutritional causes of congestive heart failure? Because the, the causes are many. The nutritional causes of congestive heart failure include long-standing atherosclerosis and high blood pressure. So the prevention, from a nutritional standpoint, of congestive heart failure is consistent 
with the other major causes of heart disease. The caveat that we add to that or the addition that we add to that is sodium must be restricted and oftentimes physicians will prescribe diuretics to decrease that fluid volume. So I'm gonna refer you back to the lecture on hydration. Individuals who have congestive heart failure are oftentimes extremely thirsty because it isn't the intent to make them fluid depleted. It is the intent. So now we're gonna look at some risk factors, th things that you might um, be aware of or not aware of. Non-modifiable risk factors are things that we really can't change, but we need to be aware of them. Age. Well, if we're all lucky enough, we're all gonna live to a ripe old age. Some of the statistics suggest even individuals at age 55 who have normal blood pressure are gonna develop high blood pressure in their lifetime. In fact, some estimates suggest up to 90% of people who are normotensive, have normal blood pressure at age 55, will develop high blood pressure. So keep in mind, get that checked on a regular basis. Certainly along with age can oftentimes in, in, increase in blood lipids. Glucose intolerance, the likelihood of metabolic syndrome and diabetes that we'll refer to later. So I think after age 35 in men and after age 45 in women, the probability of dying of cardiovascular disease increases. But that's not all gloom and doom because there's so much that we can do to prevent that. Lifestyle modification is effective at reducing some of the health risks that are associated with aging. Gender, well, I have to tell you, there's good news and bad news here. We've paid a lot of attention to cardiovascular disease in men. So actually they are uh, improving in terms of early identification and treatment, but it's women. It's women who oftentimes have a higher risk of death because symptoms go undiagnosed or untreated and oftentimes have more lethal or first, more severe first-time heart attacks. Women often believe that heart disease is a man's disease and they'll do everything within their power to take care of their sons, their husbands, and other men in the family. But they may be reluctant to seek care for chest pains. They may ignore symptoms of chest pains and oftentimes the, the symptoms feel a little bit different in women. And so oftentimes they are reluctant to go. And some studies also suggest that the treatment of these symptoms in women is oftentimes uh, attributed to something else like anxiety or stress. And again, more women are fearful of breast cancer than heart disease. Statistically, you're more likely in your lifetime to develop heart disease than you are breast cancer. But oftentimes breast cancer is where more of the fear is associated. Now what we know from the National Nurses Study, and, and nurses by definition are almost all women, about somewhere in the range of 80, 80 to 90 percent of nurses are actually female, that in the National Nurses Study the incidence of heart disease decreased about 20 percent over the study period from 1980 to 1994. So what was driving this decrease in heart disease? Smoking cessation was thought to contribute about 13 percent of the decline in heart disease. Improvement in diet about 16%. Now keep in mind, these percentages are not necessarily additive, but what we're looking at is we've got more evidence to suggest that making a change any time in your life can really um, improve your, uh, or decrease your likelihood of developing heart disease. The key finding here is that heart disease is an equal opportunity killer for men and women. Women just generally have their heart disease expressed a little bit later than men, but it's an equal opportunity killer. Now, there's even a higher risk for women who have diabetes. Some estimates suggest that with diabetes, the risk of heart disease is five times normal. So please don't ever say, I've just got a little touch of sugar, or my doctor says my blood sugar is a little bit high. This is one of your red warning lights in your car. This is coming up on the dashboard. Every single light that you've got in your car telling you got something is wrong is wrong if you have uh, diabetes, particularly type 2 diabetes. Other things such as metabolic syndrome, which we'll discuss in, in future lectures, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Um, polycystic ovarian syndrome, PCOS, is thought to be an insulin resistant disease. And oftentimes in PCOS, what happens is women have few periods, they um, have problems with fertility, they can actually have some expression of too much testosterone, so they can end up with facial hair, male pattern baldness, and they oftentimes end up with a, a male distribution in body fat. Some of this is going to be driven by estrogen, some of this is going to be driven by uh, uh, the imbalance between estrogen and testosterone. The pattern of coronary artery disease blockage is different between men and women. 
men tend to have more isolated blockage and women have a more scattered uh, blockage pattern that occupies longer portions of the vessel. So what we know is although it's an equal opportunity killer, clinically it isn't expressed the same way. So I think the tragedy is if you have diabetes, you oftentimes ignore those warning signs. If you have PCOS, we're not con connecting infertility with heart disease, but there is a connection there. Now certainly family history is really important because keep in mind that your liver is this cholesterol making machine as we've covered in, in previous lectures. It's a cholesterol making machine. And if you have a heart, heart attack risk at an early age, you really need to pay close attention to that. So your genetics play a role in developing or dying from cardiovascular disease. People who have a known predisposition should be aware of their dietary choices, choices and physical activity. Personally, my father had a, his first heart attack at 36. Well, I can look at that in two ways. One, that's obviously very bad news, but the good news for me is I know because he had early heart disease that I'm at increased risk. So I have my entire life worked very diligently to manage my cholesterol and had my children tested at a very early age to see if they inherited that genetic risk. The other tragedy is my father-in-law has had cardiovascular disease and recently passed from cardiovascular disease, so now my poor children have that, that genetic double whammy from both sides of the family. Early heart disease before the age of 50 increases the likelihood that this is a genetic cause and not necessarily diet. So think about my football player at age 27 having a heart attack. Well, if you went back and uh, traced his family history, his brother had a heart attack at 38 and his father was in his 40s. So it's that genetic expression. Keep in mind, if you have elevated cholesterol, members of your family should be tested and please include those under the eight years of age of 18 like I have done. As I told you, my three children have all had their cholesterol tested. My daughter had a cholesterol of 190 at 16, despite eating well and being athletic. Very petite girl but because she's related biologically to me and her dad, the, the, the challenge that she has is her cholesterol was elevated. Keep in mind the values of cholesterol are lower, the recommended values of cholesterol are lower in children than they are in adults. So a 190 is actually a relatively high for someone who's 16. Please, please, please don't assume that if you exercise and watch your weight and your blood fats that you're immune. Some of our, our probably best examples are going to be from the athletic world because they tend to be um, uh, publicized more in the media. Pete Maravich was a fabulous basketball player that played at my alma mater of LSU. And he actually died on the basketball court in his mid-40s playing a pickup game of basketball in a gym. If you've ever seen Pete Maravich play, unbelievably lean, physically active guy. He just was unfortunate to be related to the wrong set of parents. Jim Fix, who really popularized the running movement in the United States, and uh, the word jogging really didn't exist before Jim Fix came on the scene, died of cardiovascular disease in his, his 50s. He lived a little bit longer than his brother and his dad did, but the bottom line is he still had that genetic expression. Arthur Ashe, one of the best tennis players who ever um, graced a court, Arthur Ashe died of AIDS. He died of HIV disease from a blood transfusion he got in uh, a coronary artery bypass surgery. So I think the tragedy is we see these individuals, but how many more individuals don't we see? Now certainly NFL linemen, and depending on whose research you, you, you like or believe, have a shortened life expectancy secondary to heart disease. Some estimates suggest that lo and behold, an NFL lineman may have a life expectancy in the mid 50s. Well, why is that? What kind of diet do you think was promoted for these young men? What kind of diet was promoted? Now I've had coaches tell me, you know what, I need my, my players to gain weight. They all need to gain weight. And I actually had a coach say to me, I told my player in order to gain weight, he needed to eat a, a tube of cookie dough, uncooked cookie dough every single day to add extra calories. So to me, the abuse that has occurred in the NFL, and, and again, the promotion of these high fat diets throughout their whole entire life really has now led to an increased risk of heart disease and diabetes. So I always say football players don't die from their orthopedic injuries. Their orthopedic injuries make them less physically active. 
they die from heart disease and diabetes. So again, we've got multiple examples here of where physical activity and being physically active can't undo all the issues with, with diet and lifestyle that we encounter. Now, certainly ethnic background can make a difference. What ethnic group do you belong to? Well, for reasons that are really unknown, African Americans have more severe hypertension and as such have a greater risk of heart disease. They're more likely to have an elevation in blood pressure with increasing sodium. And so we'll explore this relationship between sodium and high blood pressure when we talk about the DASH diet. The risk of heart disease is higher in Mexican Americans and Native Americans, some Hawaiians, some Asian groups. Now, the driving factor for this is obesity and diabetes. Genetically, these ethnic groups are much more likely to have uh, type 2 diabetes. And again, dr diabetes can oftentimes drive the prevalence of heart disease. Okay, so what are the modifiable risk factors? These are things that you should and can change. Well, the modifiable ones, the major ones, include cigarette smoking, controlling blood sugar preventing diabetes, controlling your high blood pressure, controlling cholesterol, and getting moving and eating less foods. Controlling these risk factors can provide a guide to reducing your heart disease. Now I want to, again, encourage you to think about diabetes. Diabetes itself is considered a heart disease equivalent. So what that means is that individuals who have type 2 diabetes should be treated like they've already had a heart attack. They should be aggressively managed. So again, there is no such thing as a touch of sugar or, you know, I've got a little bit going on here. So oftentimes the goals for individuals who have type 2 diabetes in terms of their blood fats are much more aggressive. So again, if you've been recently diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, go and ask your physician, should my cholesterol be lower than it should have been prior to this diagnosis? And I will tell you the answer to that is going to be yes. Now we've got some frequently asked questions. Many members of my family are diabetic, so what good does it do to diet and exercise? Aren't I doomed? The answer is absolutely no. And we've had some landmark research to, to show that diet and exercise always count. This is uh, the best example is the diabetes prevention program that took people who were all high risk of diabetes and put them on intensive lifestyle modification. And again, estimates vary, but the estimated disease risk reduction was about 58% of individuals who got out and exercised, they got out and exercised and watched their calories and lost some weight. So I'm going to tell you that that piece of pivotal information really leads us to believe that, you know what, it is never too late. I can always do something to modify my risk factors. Now keep in mind, if you've got pre-existing diabetes or you've got pre-existing heart disease, your physician may have to modify your exercise program for you based on medications that you're on. But don't ever say, you know what, I'm behind the genetic eight ball. There's nothing I can do because I'm going to tell you there's always going to be something that you can do. Now, the, the next frequently asked question is the one that's really unfair. My sister doesn't watch her weight, gets very little exercise, yet I'm the one with heart disease. How come? Why is it me? And we all know people who can eat whatever they want. And we talked a little bit about this when we talked about calorie balance. They can eat whatever they want, and yet you're the one with high triglycerides or high cholesterol. Why is that the case? Well, there's this concept called genetic expression. And again, if I happen to get the wrong end of the gene pool, I can end up with a disease that you know my a biological relative didn't get. So in my particular family, uh, we, when we talk about genetic expression, I'm five foot four and my two sisters are five nine. I got the short genes, they got the tall genes. The same kind of process can happen when it comes to the genetic expression. In my three children, two of them have high cholesterol, and the two out of three that have high cholesterol are the two that are very athletic. My older son's cholesterol is perfectly okay. He's a little heavier than his siblings, and he eats a whole lot of red meat. So unfortunately, we don't always get to pick a, our parents, can't pick our parents, and we can't uh, predict what kind of genes are going to be expressed. But the take-home message with all of this is, regardless of what your family history is, regardless of what your risk, you can always make a difference with exercise, diet, and lifestyle modifications. The other caution here is make sure if you have a pre-existing disease, any of the ones that we've discussed, that you are actually going to your physician and saying, 
um, how do I modify this to make this unique and special to me? So stay tuned. We'll have more on uh, these diseases coming up in the, in the next lectures. Thank you very much.